This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Judges. And here in Judges chapter 8, we find ourselves, we're concluding a section of scripture which focuses our attention on the exploits of a judge named Gideon. As we make our way through our text tonight, well, we're going to see how this Old Testament judge actually failed to finish well. And we're going to see that while Gideon was a leader who knew how to wage war against Israel's external enemies, he really didn't do so well fighting against his own personal enemies. He didn't do so well fighting against the sinful desires which were found within the borders of his own heart. Now, in light of Gideon's example found in our text tonight, we're also going to spend some time considering the importance of finishing well. And as we do, it's my hope that every believer here tonight will realize that while we're here in this world, our sinful lusts, well, we always have them with us. While we're still here in this world, uh, you know, we're always going to be struggling with our carnal desires. Our lusts will always be here to lead us away from the victorious liberty of the Lord and back into the bondage of our carnal cravings. And with that being the case, well, we must always walk by faith in the one who alone is able to give us the victory over our sinful nature. Well, with this as our focus, let's begin our overview of this thrilling chapter. And so if you would look with me there at Judges chapter 8, I want to begin reading at verse 1. There we read, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. Now, here in the opening verse of this chapter, we find the men from the tribe of Ephraim, and they're challenging Gideon for his decision to exclude them from the initial battle against the Midianites. And these guys were basically wanting to know why they hadn't been invited to the party, or at least why they received a late invitation. These guys wanted to know why weren't they invited to the initial fight against the Midianites? Why were they invited but only after the Midianites made their retreat? Well, they were blaming Gideon for that decision, but I'll remind you, this decision was based on the leading of the Lord. Remember, it was in our text last week where we learned about the day when the Lord handpicked 300 Israelites to fight this battle. Then after the Lord used this small band of men to prevail against the military, uh, Gideon then invited the Ephraimites to help those 300 men to pursue their fleeing foes. And while the Ephraimites were happy to help, they were also disappointed with their delayed invitation. Well, in response to this reprimand, Gideon presented the Ephraimites with another way of looking at the situation. If you would look with me, beginning there at verse 2. There we learn that Gideon said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. Now, here in these verses, we find Gideon, he's actually responding to the Ephraimites with great humility. They came reprimanding him sharply, and he could have fired back with, hey, God told me to do this, you jerk, you know, but he didn't. He actually responded with great humility, and he did this by pointing out that the greatest victory in the entire battle, it occurred when the Ephraimites captured the princes of Midian, whose names were Oreb and Zeb. In this way, Gideon, he was showing great leadership by choosing to douse the flames of Ephraim's anger with the cold water of a soft answer. This reminds me of something that Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 15. Solomon declares, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Based on this, I believe that every Christian would do well to learn how to deal with angry people in this sort of way. Rather than responding to anger with anger, or, or in that way, fighting fire with fire, so to speak. It's better when we respond to angry people with God's grace. 
when there's people who are angry with us, or maybe it's somebody at work, or maybe it's a spouse or, or, or a child, you know, when, when we respond to their anger with a soft answer, we'll probably get further with them than if we respond with the same sort of anger. In this way, we'll see how a soft answer turns away wrath just as Solomon wrote. And listen, not only was Gideon a leader, leader who knew how to respond with grace, but he also knew how to persevere past the point of exhaustion. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me, beginning at verse 4, there we read, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Now, here we learn that these men, they were completely exhausted, and yet, they were still pursuing the Midianites across the Jordan River. And from this, I would point out that the calling of the Lord, it's oftentimes exhausting. I've heard Christians say, well, this is hard work, and I don't think the Lord would call me to do something hard. Not so. The Lord typically will only call us to do something that's hard and difficult and beyond our skill level and beyond our abilities. It's the fact that the Lord would call you to something that you could do uh, seems to suggest to me that that's not what he's calling you to do. He's always going to call us to do something more than what we could naturally do so that he can get the glory out of us. And so if you're exhausted in ministry, realize that it's probably, you're probably doing what the Lord is calling you to do because it takes more than what you can do to accomplish what the Lord is calling you to do. Our exhaustion is no reason to give up on the ministry that the Lord has given to us. And knowing that the Lord was the one who had called them to, to go and defeat the Midianites in this way, well, Gideon understood that their exhaustion was no reason to stop. Gideon continued to lead his men past this point of exhaustion so that they could actually accomplish their heavenly calling. And as they pressed on, Gideon continued to demonstrate great leadership qualities by seeking sustenance for his soldiers. With this in mind, look with me there, beginning at verse 5, because there we read, Then he said to the men of Succoth, Please give me loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna, into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them and in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So he spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Now, here in these verses, we find Gideon. He's actually attempting to acquire some bread for his soldiers. And so he asks the Israelites who were living in the cities of Sukkoth and Penuel to provide them with the nourishment that they needed. However, these leaders of these cities, they were unwilling to provide them with food to continue fighting. And, and just as Gideon promised, well, this was a decision which would come back to bite them in the end. We'll see in a few minutes as we make our way through this text how Gideon does come back and make good on that promise. But now before I get ahead of our text here, I just want to point out that Gideon was a leader who knew that his exhausted soldiers needed the nourishment of bread in order to continue fighting so that they could accomplish their mission. Therefore, he was going to do everything that he could do to make sure that they had the bread that they needed. Now, if you'll allow me the liberty of spiritualizing this situation for a moment, I, I want to first remind you here that it's in Luke chapter 4 where we find the Lord Jesus declaring, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. From this, it's important for every Christian to recognize that the only way for us to continue fighting the good fight of faith is to make sure that we're spending time each and every day seeking the spiritual nourishment that can only come from God's Word. In other words, we don't just need physical food so that we have physical, physical energy to keep moving forward, but we need spiritual food. We need spiritual bread to accomplish the ministry that God is calling us to accomplish. We need to be spending time in God's Word each and every day. And listen, how many times do you eat a day? Chances are you eat, you know, three, four meals a day, maybe five for some of us. 
How many times do you get in God's Word a day? How many times do you sit and, and just eat the bread of God's Word so that you have the spiritual energy to keep moving forward? We need to spend time consuming God's word, ingesting God's word so that we have the spiritual nutrition that we need to do what God is calling us to do. And much like Gideon, listen, every good spiritual leader will spend time leading the people that they're leading to the spiritual bread that's found in God's word. True spiritual leaders will seek to sustain the soldiers of Christ with the bread of God's word. And it's for this reason that Christians should be looking for pastors who are taking them to God's word. Not to silly stories, not to great illustrations, uh, not to wonderful, you know, alliterations and all kinds of, you know. Uh, no, God's word is what God's people need. We need God's word to continue to move forward and accomplish his will. Well, as we get back to our text here, we aren't really told if Gideon found food for his men. I'm guessing that he did somewhere. What we do know is that they eventually caught up with the Midianites. And with this is our focus, look with me beginning at verse 10, because there we read now Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents uh, on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Heres, and he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Succoth and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Succoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. Then he tore down the tower of Penuel, and killed the men of the city. Now here in these verses, we find Gideon, he's actually catching up to the Midianites and capturing the kings of Midian. And after securing this victory, he brought these Midianite kings back to the cities of Sukkoth and Penuel to say, see, told you so. He wanted to show them how the Lord had given them the victory over these enemies. And just as he had promised, well, Gideon punished those who would not share their bread with his soldiers. But now as we consider the details found in these verses, you might be wondering, you know, why did one town get one form of punishment and, and the other town got another form of punishment? You see, Gideon came and took briars and whipped the men in Sukkoth, but then went on to Penuel and killed the men in Penuel. This seems a little unjust. I mean, they both did the same thing, right? They were both guilty of withholding bread from the troops, and so why is one town whipped and the other town killed? Well, we aren't really told, but if I had to guess, then it seems reasonable to me to conclude that the leaders of Penuel were probably hiding behind this defensive wall. They probably had this defensive tower, and it was probably part of the defensive wall of the city, and they probably communicated from that defensive wall, and they probably, at, at the first visit of Gideon stood on that wall saying, you can't come in and you can't have our bread. And that's when Gideon probably said, I'm going to come back and tear this wall down and deal with you. I'm going to guess that as he comes back with his army and with his captives, the kings of Midian, that they again stood on that wall and Gideon said, I'm tearing this wall down. And I'm going to guess that the men of Penuel decided to defend their defensive wall. And as a result, it was a massacre. That's my guess about what happened, but we aren't really told. Before we try to justify the attack on Penuel, before we try to think, well, Gideon had a reason for killing these men, I, I would like to suggest that Gideon actually seems to have been crossing a line in his leadership style at this point. You see, Gideon's anger with these people seems to have been based on the fact that they had mocked him and ridiculed him. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 15, because there Gideon declares, 
here are Zeba and Zalmunna about whom you ridiculed me. Clearly, Gideon was less upset about the fact that they withheld their bread, and he seems to be more upset about the fact that they had mocked him and, 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 and made fun of him. And since there's no mention of the Lord leading Gideon to punish these people in either of these ways, I'm kind of left to conclude that Gideon was beginning to take judicial matters into his own hands. The Lord had given him this position of judge and had directed him to pursue the Midianites, but now he's saying, I'm going to punish anybody that gets in my way. I'm going to punish anybody that disagrees with me. Further evidence of this degradation of Gideon's leadership, it can be seen here in his next decision. And with this as our focus, look with me there at verse 18. There we learn that Gideon said to Ziba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? So they answered, as you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. Now, there's no doubt in my mind here that these kings, they did deserve to die. I mean, when you consider all of the Israelites who died simply because of the Midianite invasion of Israel, then this execution of these Midianite kings, uh, kings it was actually a no-brainer. They deserved to die. And yet, rather than appealing to the word of God for his authority to execute these kings, Gideon, again, is making this decision based on his own personal desire for vengeance. He's not saying, look, you killed Israelites, and so therefore, based on what God's word says, you must die. Or because God has given me authority to chase you down and, and punish you in this way, you must die. No, it's not, nothing like that. He's saying, hey, you, you killed my brothers. If you hadn't killed my brothers, I'd let you go. But because you killed my brothers... Well, what about all the other Israelites that they killed? He should have been saying, hey, you killed some Israelites, and because of that, it's the death penalty for you. But he's saying, hey, you killed some of my family members, and I'm mad, and now you have to die. Then, in an attempt to shame these kings, Gideon proceeds to ask his son to carry out this execution. With this in mind, look with me, beginning at verse 20. There we read, and he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise, kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So Ziba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Now here in these verses, we find Gideon asking his young son to carry out the execution of these kings. And I'm going to guess that this was really uh, a twofold decision here. I think that this was a way of promoting the status of his own son so that he could say, hey, my son killed the kings of Midian. But not only that, I believe that this was also a way of diminishing the status of these Midianite kings because the stories would be told that a youth killed the kings of Midian. That was, I think, Gideon's plan. And it's sad to say that his plan fell apart before his very eyes because his son was simply too afraid to draw his sword to kill these men. As a result, these kings mocked Gideon with their dying breath. They said, you come kill us then. That's pretty bold. They challenged him, hey, you man up and carry out the executions with your own strength. And so that's what he did. Now, it's true that Gideon was God's judge, and it's true that he had the authority to execute these kings, but he seems to have been struggling to grasp the difference between God's sovereign authority and his own desire for revenge. Here in this situation, he was carrying out God's authority. He, he was acting upon God's authority, and yet it was so tainted by his own desires for revenge. And I think that he had a hard time distinguishing between the two. In order to further explain why I say this, I want to continue to make our way through this chapter. And so look with me, beginning at verse 22, because there we read, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now here in these verses, we find the men of Israel, they're ready to make Gideon their king. And I should remind you that this was about 130 years before Saul became uh, the, the, the first real king uh, of Israel. 
That being the case, Gideon was correctly responding to this request by encouraging these Israelites to look to the king of kings for their theocratic rule. They, they, he was saying, hey, if you want someone to rule over you, let the Lord rule over you. And that is the correct answer. And yet at the same time, I should also point out that Gideon's rejection of this position, it seems to have been a bit disingenuous. I believe that he truly did want to become the king of Israel, and yet uh, he, he was unwilling to, to stick his neck out that far uh, without the leading of the Lord. In order to explain what I, why I say this, if you would look with me at, at verse 24, because there we read, then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from the, his plunder, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them, and they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, because the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the, the, their camels' necks. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Aphra, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Now, here in these verses, we find Gideon, he's collecting all these golden earrings and crescent moon ornaments and gold chains and whatnot. And, and after collecting these golden earrings from the spoil that had been collected by his 300 soldiers, Gideon then proceeds to use all of this gold to create this golden ephod, which he kept there in his own hometown. It'll help us to understand that the word ephod found there in verse 27, it's actually translated from a Hebrew word which was used in reference to a priestly garment. Now it's true that the Lord had instructed Moses to create an ephod for the high priest of Israel, and, and yet it's also true that God never directed Gideon to make this golden ephod for himself. Unfortunately, he did, and as a result, the Israelites began to worship Gideon's golden ephod. They played the harlot with it. In other words, they began to worship it rather than God. Not only that, but this ephod ended up becoming a snare, a trap to him and to his family. And as we consider the problems which were caused by this ephod, I can't help but to wonder what his reasons were for creating this golden garment. One, well, in order to speculate about this, it's interesting to note that in ancient Egypt and even in Mesopotamia, Golden garments like this one, they were used to clothe their idols. They were also used to, for a select group of officials like, like the royal family or, or, or their priests. And I'm going to guess that Gideon had seen golden ephods like this one. I can't help but to wonder if Gideon didn't create this golden ephod in order to establish his own leadership over Israel. I have to assume that while he was saying no to their request to make him king, in his heart, he really wanted the position. I'm going to guess that he made this ephod so that he could kind of set himself up as this leader over Israel. As we consider the evidence, it, it seems plausible, if not even probable. If, in order to prove my point, I want to examine the life of Gideon after this ephod was created. And so look with me beginning at verse 28, because there we read, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Now here in these verses, we learn that Gideon, or Jerubal as he was known, ended up engaging in polygamy after creating this ephod. Before we only hear of his son and grandson, we don't hear about all these sons, we hear nothing about all these wives, but now, after creating this ephod, He's got many wives, and we're not told how many wives were in his harem, but what we do know is that he ended up with 70 sons. Not only that, but he also had at least one concubine who's mentioned here, and she lived in Shechem, and he had one son with this concubine whom he named Abimelech. Now, what's very interesting about this is that the name Abimelech actually means, my father is king. That's what the name means. 
He names his son through this, this concubine, my father is king. What does that say about himself? That he's the king. While he verbally rejected the position of king, it seems apparent to me, based on his actions, that Gideon saw himself the king of Israel. He makes himself an ephod. He starts taking on a bunch of wives. And then he names one of his sons. My father is king. In our study next week, we'll learn more about the problems which were caused by Gideon's son Abimelech. But for now, let it suffice to say that Though Gideon began to serve the Lord as a judge with great faith, he was also a man who did not finish well. Not only did he end up leading the people of Israel back into spiritual adultery with his golden ephod, but he also failed to leave behind a lasting legacy of faithful obedience there in the land of Israel. As a matter of fact, the nation of Israel quickly returned to their worship of Baal shortly after Gideon's death. And with this is our focus, let's Let's look at the final verses of this chapter, beginning at verse 32. There we read, Now Gideon the son of Joash died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash his father in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bereth their god. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their god who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubal, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we see how quickly the Israelites returned to their worship of this false god known as Baal. And while it's true that Gideon originally had the faith to lead 300 Israelites against the massive military of the Midianites, it's also true that he failed to finish he failed to finish well and the reason why was due to the fact that he forgot that God is the one who delivered them from the hands of their enemies therefore rather than continuing to walk in, in the humble faith that he had at the beginning of, of his service Gideon ended up taking his relationship with God for granted and this caused him to view the victory of the Lord as the work of his own hands. He took matters into his own hands. He quit trusting in the Lord. His faith was, at the end, placed in himself rather than God. Now, As we consider the rise and fall of Gideon, I think that it would be good for us to spend a moment considering the importance of faith and the need for faith in finishing well. You see, it's, it's common for Christians like us to answer God's call to serve him with, with the humility of Gideon, with the dependent faith that Gideon had when he first began. It's, it's common for us to say, really, Lord, is that your voice, Lord? Prove it to me, Lord. I, I want to serve you, but I want to make sure that you're the one calling me to this. And, and we have that humble faith to start well. And we're blown away, just like Gideon was, when, when, when God calls us to serve him in some way. As we begin to experience the victory of the Lord, well, it's not long before many Christians begin to forget that God is the one who called them to it, and God is the one who gave them the victory. As a result, there are believers who fail to continue walking in a victorious Christian life simply because they stop relying upon the Lord for their strength to serve him. They start leaning upon their own flesh. They, they start doing it in the flesh. These believers begin to suffer from spiritual exhaustion. Serving the Lord is no longer a joy, it's a chore. It's no longer something that you look forward to, it's something that you dread. And the reason why is because these believers have stopped spending time seeking the spiritual nourishment which is found in God's word can't find the bread that you need to have the energy to move on. And, and rather than blaming yourself for not bringing bread with you, you blame the people in Sukkoth or Penuel. Someone else's fault that I don't have the spiritual nourishment that I need. We start blaming everybody else. We start getting mad at everybody else. Everybody else is in our way. 
not long before these believers stop serving the Lord altogether. And the reason why is because they're too busy making a golden ephod for themselves. And they go back to, to, to the lusts of the flesh, just like Gideon did. Gideon could have spent the rest of his life serving the Lord and being a good judge over the people. But instead, he spent the rest of his life collecting women, having kids. He returned to the pursuit of his own personal pleasures, and there are many Christians who do the same thing. They start well, then they do it in the flesh, and they forget who gave them the victory in the first place. The next thing you know, they've returned to a pursuit of their own personal pleasures. Much like Gideon, these Christians end up failing to finish well. Now, if this sounds like the path that you've been headed down, then I encourage you to remember what Paul said in Hebrews 12 when he declared, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Christian, listen, Jesus is the author of our faith, but he's not only the author of our faith, but he's the one who can help us to finish walking out the faith that he's authored. It doesn't just take faith to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. It takes faith to answer his calling, and then it takes faith to serve him according to that calling, and it takes continual faith to finish well. We have to continue walking in faith, believing in the one who can give us the victory. Listen, it's only by faith in Jesus that we can continue to escape the traps and the snares of our own sinful nature. Therefore, we must always remember that Jesus is the one who gives us the victory over every enemy. And the only way that we can continue to run with endurance the race that's been set before us is by faith. We must continue to run with faith faith in our Savior, because our Savior is the one who alone can help us to finish well. 